Hello, everyone. I would like to welcome everyone to tonight's webinar, The Path to Becoming a U.S. Trained Dentist, presented by the American Student Dental Association and sponsored by the American Dental Association. Tonight's program will provide tips for a successful application to dental school and career choices for international dentists who want to practice in the United States. The presenters will explain the differences between an ASIDP and a residency program, share how to improve your application in order, in order to gain acceptance into dental school, explore options on progressing your career after graduating from dental school, and at the end we'll have a, a question and answer session for the attendees uh, at the very end. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. All attendees are muted so that, it won't, so that we don't pick up any background noise during the pro, uh, program. The webinar will be recorded and posted on ASDO's website within a week. Um, and a link will be emailed to all, the, all that have registered for the webinar. You will notice a control panel on the right side of your screen. You can type your question into the screen and it will be added to the queue. The Q&A portion of the webinar will take place at the very end. My name is Brian Jones. I'm ASDA's Membership Development Manager, and I will be serving as the facilitator for tonight's program. ASDA has a staff of 14 association professionals in our central office located in Chicago, Illinois. I have worked for ASDA for one year, and my main responsibility is creating and managing initiatives to increase pre dental membership and engagement in ASDA. I serve as ASDA's staff liaison to ASDA's Council on Membership, the pre dental Advisory Committee, the pre dental Planning Committee, and the ASIDP Advisory Committee. I help develop and plan pre-dental initiatives such as our webinars, educational offerings, and campaigns like Pre-Dental Week. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have regarding as to membership. Our panelists this evening are Dr. Amro El-Khatib, excuse me, a class of 2016 students of the University of Pacific Arthur A. Dugani School of Dentistry. Amro was born in Germany but raised in at Cairo, Egypt. Amro serves on ASDA's ASIDP Advisory Committee. Our other panelist is Dr. Manis Juneja, an advanced standing class of 2017 student of the Boston University Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine. Manish is originally from New Delhi, India. Manish also serves on ASDA's ASIDP Advisory Committee. I'm now going to turn over the presentation to our first speaker, Dr. Amro. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Brian, for the introduction. My name is Amro Al Khatib. I'm a graduate of the University of the Pacific. School of Dentistry, class of 2016. Um, I actually did graduate a couple of months ago, just went by pretty quickly. And um, I'm pretty thrilled to be with all of you here today. Um, what I'm really excited about is that we are serving on the first ever committee to represent international dentists in the U.S. And I think this is actually a historic moment uh, for education in the U.S. in general because um, international dentists are um, actually representing um, a good percentage of those working in the dental environment here in the U.S. And I think this is a great way to voice our um, concerns, our challenges, and also be able to integrate more with the dental community over here. So I would like to welcome you all today and uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I want to go ahead and start my presentation to you with what is your goal? So this is um, it's a pretty critical question. Um, right now, every single one of us, you, me, everybody else, we have a current situation that we are in and we have a goal, a goal after five years, after ten years. You need to ask yourself, what is my goal? Uh, when I move to the U.S., what am I looking for? And these uh, bullet points over here are something to guide you a little bit. So are you here to get a little bit more education about the basics, what you learned, um, basically 
um, you could say the foundation of dentistry, or you're just interested basically to get have a license to work over here. Are you interested in being a general practitioner dentist, or are you interested in being a specialist in going through residency? Do you want to, after earning um, a dental degree here in the U.S. or uh, completing a residency program to practice in the U.S. or abroad? Well, if you want to practice in the U.S., do you want to practice in a certain state or in a different state? And all these questions are not just personal because every single one of us has um, their families. They have their significant others. So this is a question to ask not just to yourself, but everybody around you, what is your goal? And I stress on the first word that I mentioned in this PowerPoint, which is education. Um, this is going to be a learning, an absolutely fascinating um, learning journey. So my immediate and continuous advice to you all is be open to learn. You will continue to learn for the rest of your life. No matter you come to the U.S. or you go to another country, that is the essence of development in the whole world. And from the beginning, if you realize that you will be in those chairs as a student or as a resident, and you are open to learn, this is going to make it much, much more easier to you, um, and actually for everybody around you as well. So from the beginning, what I advise you all to have in mind that you are open, you are prepared to learn. Now moving forward, I'll start talking about the different pathways that people um, or you could say dentists from all over the world take in order to be licensed to practice here in the US. One of them is through the AAGD program which is the Advanced Education in General Dentistry. and. Um, this program is basically like a multidisciplinary um, dental program where you go ahead and have access to doing different types of uh, dentistry, uh, different type of procedures, different um, in different departments, and um, you have immediate care, or I, I would say um, not immediate, but rather shorter time difference between you being admitted into this program and starting care on the patients. Um, how many programs are there? Not much. And um, I, um, I also spoke to a number of my colleagues who went through this program and I heard there were a little bit more before but unfortunately they became a little bit less in number. So in comparison to, that, to those programs that would give you a DDS degree, they are much less. Uh, you don't have the same educational requirements. Uh, you may be required in these programs to do some research and uh, maybe um, some sort of exams, but it wouldn't be as much as the regular uh, international dental program. Um, one thing that a lot of people do not realize is that if you complete an AGD program, you will still keep whatever original dental degree you earned before. So if you earned um, a bachelor in dental surgery, which is a BDS, that's typically like the, the most common one, um, you will find that if you apply to postgraduate programs after the AGD, like if you want to do specialty in endo or um, oral maxillofacial surgery or prothodontics, whatever that you choose, you will still be considered as an international dentist, not a, or a, say an inter international applicant not as uh, a dental applicant in the US. So you will still have that uh, BDS. In addition to it, you will have the AGD certificate. Uh, usually the tuition fees is less than that of a DD, the international dental program. Sometimes they would actually uh, pay you, which is a, st a stipend. Uh, not all programs do that. It really differs from one program to another. Uh, also, something really important to know is that uh, once you earn that AGD, in order to work in states, it has some restrictions. That means not all states accept that you have an AGD to work. Um, some states, they require a number of years. It varies from one, two, and three years. Uh, some states would not let you work in them even if you worked in the original state for um, 
more than five years because there is um, a kind of known uh, concept known as uh, reciprocity where if you had a license uh, somewhere for more than five years you can go to another state and uh, through reciprocity get the license over there. If you don't have the educational requirements of that other state which could be a DDS degree which is doctor in dental surgery or of dental surgery uh, most probably you will not be able to work over there. So this is something to keep in mind and it's really good um, to go ahead and contact the individual boards uh, about what are the requirements and uh, at the end of my presentation you'll find a lot of links that you can go and see for each state what what is the requirements for them. Um, you can call them on the phone, ask them a little bit and hence I go back to the question is what is your goal? If you already have a state in mind, then you go ahead and focus on that state and ask about the questions related to it. Typically, the application for the AGD is through PASS, uh, which is a search engine for uh, postdoctoral programs. Um, some programs ask you to apply directly to them, so it is program specific. Now, moving on to the most common. Uh, route you could say to uh, become licensed in the US which is the international dental program so in the international dental program you earn uh, the same dental degree as uh, US graduates and that is basically a uh, doctor of dental surgery which is the majority or a uh, doctor of dental medicine and they're exactly the same the only thing is the wording is a little bit different so it's DDS or DMD um, there is definitely more programs in comparison to AGD in, in, in the sense that they accept international dentists because AGD programs are a lot but uh, only a few accept internationals. Uh, there is a preclinical phase that you have to go through before you can see any patients. So this is something to keep in mind. You will have to be working on typodonts, on mannequins, plastic teeth before you can go ahead to clinic. That is typically uh, how you move forward in the IDP program. There is definitely more educational requirements and hence going back to the concept of this is a learning journey. You're going to earn a DDS degree and uh, for the most programs I've seen it's exactly the same as US graduates. Um, I recall there was only one program that mentioned it's going to be different uh, I think that was changed recently, um, but uh, earning the DDS degree uh, will uh, put you at the same level basically when you are applying for licensure. Uh, there is definitely more tuition fees to these programs in comparison to the AAGD, and there is no stipend. Uh, there is no licensure restrictions in, in a sense that you can work in any state you want given the fact you complete their other requirements which includes the national board examinations, I'm sure you all heard of them, MBDE part one and part two, and um, completing the regional board exams, which um, I will talk about a little bit later. How do you apply to them? Uh, I would say uh, for 90% of them you apply through CAPID, which is a search engine for IDP programs. Um, a few of them only require that you apply directly without uh, having CAPID. Actually, some programs they do not have an IDP program, but they let you know it's a year-by-year year basis. So sometimes what they would do, if one year they do have an opening, they would allow, allow an international dentist to come in. Uh, typically, it's through contact with the program, and if you've been doing like some sort of shadowing over there or had some research, typically it's a little bit open to you. Also, like having a master's degree, I would say, in, in public health in that university helps a little bit, just in case uh, they, do, they do have this kind of opening. Now, moving forward, uh, a lot of people also, from the beginning, they do not want to do the general practice, um, whether it's through IDP or uh, through AGD. They want to go ahead and do the residency. And typically, it's somebody who did some sort of residency in their home country. So um, what I need to tell you, it's going to be, uh, it has different criteria in acceptance in a sense that uh, acceptance of international dentists is program specific. It really depends on every individual program in the number that they accept as internationals, the requirements, and uh, I would strongly uh, encourage you to take a look at the requirements because it gets pretty detailed. 
Uh, you will also have direct access to patient care once you're accepted in that residency. Um, there is a high possibility you will be asked to do research and there may or may not be other educational requirements. Uh, again, you will be keeping that original dental degree that you got, just like the AGD exactly. If you do have a bachelor degree or um, a bachelor of dental surgery, a BDS, you'll continue having that. So this, um, again, is slightly different when you want to apply for licensure. Um, and here I go, I mentioned it, that there is licensure restrictions to specific states. Um, some states would only allow you to work within the confinement of the educational institute, for example, in a university or um, like um, some sort of, um, I would say, educational related facilities, okay? And you do apply through PASS, which is, again, the uh, postdoctoral um, search engine. Um, I'll be posting a link for it at the end, so you can all take a look at it. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the state licensure requirements and how things work in order for you to work here in the U.S. So typically there are three main components. Of course, there are other things that you need to complete as well, but these are the main ones that you need to complete. So number one, it has to be a completion of CODA accredited program, okay? Because remember, uh, there are programs here in the U.S. that are not CODA accredited. So this is something to keep in mind, okay? And a uh, code accredited program could be a DDS program, could be an AGD program, could be a residency program. Um, DDS opens the doors for you to be licensed, um, I would say, everywhere, okay? You uh, complete that first part of the licensure requirement. Um, doing AGD or residency, again, uh, depends on the state and is length specific which means uh, some states would allow you to work if you completed one year of AGD, other states would allow you to work if you did two years, other states would allow you to do uh, three, and so on, and others wouldn't allow you even if you did more than three, because basically they want a DDS degree. Uh, the, th the second component is uh, completing the National uh, Board of Dental Examinations, which is MBDE Part 1 and Part 2, and um, I think that is it's getting more and more common that we find IDP programs asking for both these parts completed even before you apply. Um, in the beginning, it used to be only one part. Um, I think the reason why they're asking for part number two is because you, when, once you get into that program, you're going to realize how um, fully occupied you're going to be and taking one more thing off your mind which is part two is going to definitely make your life much more easier and I'm talking from my own experience because when I got accepted at University of the Pacific uh, I only had part one completed and um, during my clinic time I had to prepare for uh, part two and that was very hard to do so if you can do both parts just go for it I would absolutely recommend it. And the third main requirement is completing the, uh, the regional board examination. So basically, in addition to having um, a DDS degree, for instance, and completing both parts of the national board examinations, uh, there are different uh, regional boards that regulate um, certain examinations to test how competent you are in doing um, certain procedures on patients. So typically the ones that are very common and um, I'd say very popular among the states are the REB and the NERB. Uh, you can also access their websites to see uh, what do they include. Um, I personally completed the REB exam, which is the Western Regional Board Examination. Um, they ask you to do um, basically um, a restorative portion of the exam. Uh, on a live patient, um, a periodontal portion, which is also on a live patient. Uh, there is an endodontic portion, which is on an extracted tooth. And there is um, a component which is related to uh, treatment planning. Uh, I believe if you go into an IDP program, um, they prepare you pretty well for these examinations in the sense that everybody around you will be taking them, um, whether it's REB or NERB. Um, it's going to be a little bit different which school you go to, and I would say it, it differs really from East Coast to West Coast. 
because typically the ones towards the west are more accepted with reps, towards the east are more accepted with nerves. So you need also to check if you want to work, for example, in, uh, in California, uh, do they accept reps or do they accept nerves? So this is something to look after. So um, you went ahead and you went through an IDP program and you graduated. Now what? What are the opportunities that are present to you as a dentist? So at this point in time, once you earn that DDS degree, you are not considered as uh, an international dentist, you are considered as a dentist in the US. So basically, you would have the same opportunities as everybody else who have the same degree. Um, Career-wise, you can work in private practice, which I'm currently doing in California. Um, you could be a general practitioner. You could also work in nonprofit organizations as a GP. And um, you can go ahead and also be affiliated with educational institutes as a uh, faculty. Now, how about educational opportunities? Uh, some people, even after like doing their BDS and DDS, uh, they would like to uh, have more hands-on experience because remember that although you and there is, I would say, between 20 to maybe 100 other students together in, in one class and you are called the IDP class or the IDS class or uh, whatever other acronym that's used, it does not necessarily mean that all of you are the same. We all come from many different backgrounds, many different experiences. Even from the same country, you would find people with different points of views. Um, some people have 20 years of experience. Some people just graduated last year. Uh, some people um, they um, they did residencies and are specialists already. Some people would like to explore different areas. So that's why it's it's really um, it's really I would say rewarding that um, once you have that opportunity open to continue that in the U.S. as well. Um, but I cannot stress again on the main message that I want to relate to all of you, which is having this as a learning journey being open about learning all the time. Even right now, I mean, some people after they earn their BDS and then the DDS, they believe, well, you know what, I earned like two dental degrees right now. I, I think I learned enough about dentistry, but you will be amazed. Many things um, you could still learn about and being open to it is going to just broaden your horizon, make you understand that there is always room for improvement, which is going to absolutely add to your career, add to you as a dentist. So going back to that point about the educational opportunities, um, could also do a residency in, in surgery or, or endo or, um, or orthodontics. Um, these are absolutely open for you, so something to consider as well. Now, um, these uh, couple of slides are, are just for you to uh, just explore, and uh, these are just the common terms because I wrote them down. I personally didn't really know uh, before coming here to the U.S. Like I, I, I had like a dental degree, I didn't know what is it called or is it different from the the one in the U.S. So just to uh, basically break them down for you, so um, you have an idea of them. So basically, for the most part. 90% of the students have a bachelor's degree of dental surgery. The ones you earn here in the U.S. are either DDS or DMD. They're exactly the same. Exactly the same. No difference at all. Just the naming is different. AGD is the Advanced Education General Dentistry. Now, a new term which is called GPR, and maybe some of you heard about that before. It's called General Practice Residency. It's I would say like very similar to AGD, but it's more hospital based. That's the difference. That AGD you can go home and sleep, but GPR you may be on call. Uh, MBDE, uh, which is the National Board Dental Examinations, that most probably will have to take these both parts or one of them before being uh, accepted in, in some programs. And um, here is the website for it if you want to go ahead and take a look at more information. Now, um, regarding your application to these programs, you got the CAPID, which is the Centralized Application for Advanced Placement Programs uh, for International Dentists. That is for the international dental programs that you will earn a DDS degree or DMD afterwards. 
uh, there is the postdoctoral application uh, support service, which is PASS, and that's basically for the uh, the residency programs. Um, I do need to mention that some residency programs do not uh, contribute to PASS, uh, to PASS, and they use what is known as Match. Um, I think it's a little, I would say, complicated to explain this because um, it has a couple of factors that are involved. Um, but um, you can definitely go ahead and explore that on the website. Um, I think mainly, I would say, uh, there is uh, oral surgery programs and some ortho programs that are in, in match. Uh, but um, do not try to overwhelm yourself with these informations. Try to keep it basic and um, go basically for the things that you're looking for. Now, the, this is a very important one, the uh, dental boards of uh, individual, individual states in the U.S. Uh, that's the link for it. If you go uh, on that website, it will show you all the, um, the dental boards of, of, of individual states. So you can go on that website, you can see their contact information if you need to call them. Uh, you can find all the information over there, uh, what they need, uh, what regional boards they accept. Um, it can also include educational um, requirements. And remember that some of the wordings are very specific, so make sure you ask about all details, okay? Uh, CODA, which is Commission on Dental Accreditation, as I mentioned, um, in order to be uh, accepted for licensure in states, they ask you to complete a number of years uh, of programs accredited by CODA. Some programs are not accredited by CODA, so this is something to uh, keep in mind. And finally, I wanted to list like two of the, uh, say, major regional boards, the Western, uh, the REBS, and the Northeast Regional Board. Uh, you can go on their websites and, and take a look at the information, uh, what kind of procedures do they do, and how things go. Uh, again, if you go mainly for the IDP programs, for international dental uh, programs, you, they, you will be well prepared for them because that is part of your curriculum as well. So at the end, I would like to wish you all good luck and um, I'm sure um, that every one of you has their own individualized journey that they're going to be taking. Um, remember that you are international dentist and um, Meanwhile, some of your colleagues at school who are going to be um, den uh, like dental students in the regular program have never saw a, a live patient before or never treated before, uh, but actually you did. So what I would um, tell you from my own journey is, again, stay open, uh, learn a lot, and it's going to be amazing the things you're going to find, and you are bringing a lot to the table as an international dentist. Uh, you are bringing actually amazing things and integrating yourself in the dental community here in the U.S. is not just going to benefit us or the other dental students, it's going to benefit absolutely everyone. So uh, I encourage you all to um, go for it, do not let anything hold you back. Um, our committee is here to support you and voice your concerns. Uh, this is our Facebook page, and um, also I included the page of uh, our tips on, on ASDA, on ASDA's website, so you can go ahead and take a look at it. So that would be my contribution uh, to this presentation. I will uh, hand the mic back to uh, Brian, and then it will be uh, my colleague Manish's turn for his presentation. All right, good luck. Thank you, Amro. I'm now turning this over to Dr. Manish. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Amro, for such a wonderful presentation, a uh, very in-depth presentation about uh, what we should be, we can do as a U.S. dentist. And thank you, Brian, for such a wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, thank you, Asta, for giving us this opportunity to conduct this webinar and help our colleagues who want to apply to become U.S. trained dentists. 
So uh, my name is Manish Juneja. Uh, I'm uh, Brian already uh, have given you uh, my introduction. So my topic uh, where I'm going to talk about is uh, how do you improve your application to gain acceptance in the dental school? Well, this is the most sought of question that anybody who's applying to the US dental school is uh, asking. And um, yeah, the important factors that you have to look into when you're applying for your uh, application to US dental school is your personal statement, your um, ECE scores, which are the course by course scores, your national board reports, and mostly uh, people you know give part one report. But now, in the future, there's going to be a time when they're going to integrate uh, national boards part one and part two together. Very soon, you would need both the uh, reports to apply to dental schools. But as of now, you can apply to a few handful of schools uh, with just part one report. And uh, then we also have a TOEFL score. We need to uh, have a very good TOEFL score to apply to dental schools in the US. Your dental experience also plays a very important role when you're applying to dental schools in the United States. Your research experience, your reference letters, and volunteering activities, all these are important factors, and one should look at all of these uh, factors when you're applying to schools in the United States. Now, let me go through each of these and uh, give you a brief in depth of what you should be uh, you know, having in your each aspects where, which, you, which can help you improve your application process. So for a personal statement, I think this is one aspect of your application that everybody uh, reads carefully and you have to give enough time for you to understand that what, how are you going to present yourself. So take time, take your time and uh, make a good personal statement and you should uh, write why do you want to join the industry again. Uh, you should have a good reason for them to explain that why do you want to do this again. You have been a dentist in your country for some, some, some applicants are recent graduates, some are with experience. So you have to give them good reason for you to accept that why you want to do dentistry again. You have to show that you are very ambitious and add this to your personal statement. And precisely most of these statement, personal statements which are not read are those which do not have examples. They, they're just made up of uh, simple statements such as, uh, I like to do community services. And that's it. So you have to have examples with, which will show that you're motivated which will show, yes, that you have those abilities. Yes, you have those uh, qualities in you. Ex also, if you have had any failures, for example, if you, for, for some reason, you, um, you were not able to uh, succeed in a particular exam, you had some failures, then you should be able to give examples and tell them how you overcome your failures in your statement of purpose. You should be able to discuss your qualities as, uh, for example, as a leader, as, um, as someone who can manage time very well, as someone who can handle stress because the, the courses over here in the United States, the IDP course, the International Dental, Dentist Program, is a very stressful ex program. So they want to see if you can handle that much of stress. So they want to know that do you have those qualities to be accepted and then go on with your program and not to uh, get stressful within the program. Also, they also want to see how ambitious you are. What, do you, what are your intent after you graduate from the US school? Most schools would like that they, they, uh, they, they see their students enrolling in residency programs or becoming one of the leaders in the uh, dental society. So you have to specify that. So that's a part of the uh, major part of your personal statement. And then the, the next important part of the uh, application is your uh, GPA, um, the ECE report. Uh, 
why do they use a GPA to you know, accept the applications? This is just to predict your academic grades for the pre-doctoral course. And most of the time, the students, uh, various applicants who apply to schools, they have, you see that we have, uh, we have a different score or we have a lesser score as compared to other applicants and they feel that their, their uh, application is not as great as the others. But in fact, that's not the case. Students with a lower GPA are also uh, get accepted and they do stand a chance and it's, it's, it's been, you know, there has been uh, even several surveys which says that GP of different countries vary. So if you're from a country where your, your colleagues from the same country have uh, a low GPS course, so you don't need to worry about and they take that into consideration. As you can see, there have been, as I said, there have been surveys and uh, there have been extreme variation in the education systems all around the world. The grading systems are very different. And there is there is, has been research that which shows that GPA can vary and they do take into consideration and you should not be discouraged if you have a lower GPA score. And we have national boards, uh, part one and part two, as Andrew said, yes, you have to have part one at least to apply to a few schools. Some schools will accept both part one and part two, but it is better to have both the uh, parts together when you apply because it increases your chances. Specifically when at this point of time, when th there's a lot of competition amongst each other, the profiles, the, the profiles that the uh, school gets are very competitive. So that's how they would weigh, you know, one applicant has both parts, other has just one part. If they are weighing the same on other aspects, they would maybe consider, uh, this, although this is not a sure shot thing, but yes, having both the parts definitely gives you a better weightage. And uh, in the beginning of 2020, they're going to start an uh, integrated national board, which is going to make things more tough. And as it definitely helps with you, uh, to you by providing uh, reprints of the national board and examination which uh, everyone uses and I, I highly recommend that that uh, is very very useful in preparing you for the national dental boards. Regarding TOEFL score, uh, several times this question has been asked uh, what is a good TOEFL score? So a good TOEFL score is as high as you can obtain but at the same time some Schools have definitive criteria for different aspects of the uh, TOEFL exam. So it is better to follow with the school, but again, not to keep it to the minimum. If you have got a lower score, it, it is suggested that you give your TOEFL exam again before applying to the school and upgrade it, you know, try to get a better score. Because that's what they need to know if you have good uh, communication skills whether you can communicate well with others in the, in the language which is well spoken over here, English. And that's how they check your TOEFL score. So each school has a different criteria and they, they also, it has been shown that students who have higher TOEFL score, they do very well in their final day in their school GPA and they, that's how they expect that your application should show that there's a high TOEFL score. So they expect that this student is going to do very well in our program. So dental experience is again a very important part of your application. Although I would say there are students who get uh, into dental school without much of dental experience, but then it's an overall profile that they're looking at. You, uh, your experience as a, in school as an attorney your experience after school, especially your experience as um, as an attorney or someone as an observer or, a sh or as sh a shadowing uh, in a dental clinic in the United States is a very helpful in improving your profile. And things that you do to improve your manual dexterity, dexterity is also something that would add to your dental experience. In fact, not just dental experience, uh, some sort of non-dental experience which improves upon your manual dexterity, such as even playing guitar, is 
also a very good point that one should mention in their personal statement. This generally shows that you you are, you are good, your hard skills are very good. Another important part of your application is your research experience. Although not everyone has uh, good research experience, but now that the the application process has become very competitive, everybody has national part one score. Everybody has like part two score. They have good TOEFL score. They have you know enormous amount of uh, dental experience, whether in the United States or out of the United States. Research experience is something that will add to your application process. You can have publications which can even range from review articles or um, something like uh, letters to editors. Uh, various journals encourage, uh, you know, letter to editors. You can, you know, send in your publications, get some research on your profile. That's a very important part, uh, as I said, because things are becoming more competitive. And it also shows that you have a critical thinking. Uh, critical thinking has become an important part of the curriculum in the United States. In fact, CODA has made it mandatory for uh, international dental program uh, students to incorporate critical thinking course in our uh, within us in our, within our program. So, if you already show that you have that thing about critical thinking in your profile, it will definitely give you a, a plus point. So. But if you don't have, you don't have to worry about it, but there you should start working on that. And as I said, you can go to internet, go to reputed journals, read articles, get some ideas on it, what to, you know, uh, what to think about the latest advances in the industry, put in your viewpoints, maybe collect some good articles and start writing a review article, or maybe get collaborated with your professors. That's the best thing if you can get collaborative with your professors, ask them to, you know, get, you get involved in research activities, especially if you are in the United States. I understand if you are not in the United States, it becomes much difficult in your home, com home country. You can get associated with your professors. In the United States, you can approach the schools, although it is difficult for someone from outside school, but you can always give it a try, especially if you're doing uh, some kind of a preceptorship or observership in any school, you should definitely approach uh, the research department. Each school generally has a research department. In fact, each department has search head. So you can go and approach them, ask them that you, you, you want to get involved in that. This is something which will give you, you know, an extra point in your profile. Reference letters. Now, this aspect of your application, I is with my experience and with what I have seen with other uh, applicants, is most neglected. Most neglected. You know, they just would tell their, their professors that uh, at the end, you know, uh, when it is time to send your reference letters, your recommendation letters, in other words, to the CAPED, they would ask the professors, give them very less time to write a letter for you. If you want a good reference letter, you need to speak to your uh, professors much in advance, and you should choose someone who knows you very well. Don't choose someone who doesn't know you well, and because they're not going to give you a very personalized letter. And you want your your best letters to go in. So definitely you choose your best bet, choose your best professors with, with, with whom you had a uh, good rapport, with whom you have worked upon. And yeah, most of the times I've seen students, ap the applicants who would, you know, are in need of recommendation letters as they have to apply for it in schools, they would um, attend or, you know, get associated with research fellows and they would straight away go and uh, ask for recommendation letters, but that that's not something they would, uh, that's not something appropriate to ask for. I think uh, that should be left at the end of your uh, association with the research fellows. And yes, your research, uh, your recommendation letters should have uh, contact information of the person who's giving it to you so that the schools can contact them to verify the information that is provided in the uh, recommendation. And yeah, you have to, it is better to have a reference letter from someone who has a diverse experience. 
like someone who who has a plenty of experience in dentistry who has an experience in research who has plenty of publications in peer reviewed reputed journals who who's been associated with dentistry for a long time because these are the people who are well known and then if they refer you your application definitely has a plus point an important thing is the volunteer activities now when I joined the school here at Boston University uh, Henry M. Goldman Dental School, every month almost there were few, uh, one or two, or maybe I think sometimes there were more community services that uh, activities were involved. So I see that my school is quite much involved in community service. So if you apply to a particular school, which, involve, which is being involved in plenty of community services, volunteering activities, you should add that to your profile. That, that should be your key uh, point in your profile. That should be something which you should highlight in your uh, personal statement. So yes, it also shows that you are motivated uh, for the study of dentistry if you are involved in something which is uh, voluntary activities which is involving dentistry. It can be dental or non-dental voluntary activity. Many times uh, applicants also ask this question, how long should I volunteer? Some students would do it for uh, 10 days because they say I am in the United States, I'm here to give my part one and I have a few days of uh, time left over before I'm going back to my India, going to, going to my own country. So an experience of uh, a few days or weeks generally doesn't count much. You need to show that you're motivated. You don't need to show that you're trying to just fulfill one aspect of your profile. You need to show that it, has, it is done very well. It is you that, uh, that it is inherent in you that you want to get involved with the community service and the volunteering activities. So overall, Whenever you're putting your application, uh, make sure you know your deadlines. Make sure you have everything ready before your deadline. Your recommendation letters, your uh, partner scores, your TOEFL scores. And if you do not have a good TOEFL score, yes, work on it and get up as much as higher a TOEFL score. The schools are looking at the overall profile and not just the um, you know one aspect of your application not just the TOEFL score, not just the GPA, not just your part one or part two. They are looking at the overall profile. They are also looking at how motivated are you. So your experience also counts here you know, and how you present yourself. So your application should be different, unique, just like you are, and you should make it much better. Just keep in mind that, that one particular thing that is you know uh, lacking in your application should not put you down. You should improve on the other things. If you have a low GPA score, don't stop yourself by thinking, oh, I have a low GPA score and I'm, I don't have much chance of getting in. You should work upon your TOEFL score. You should work upon your uh, volunteering activities. You should work upon your dental experience. If you if you do not have any, um, if you're not doing anything, if, you, if you're working, is fine. If you're not working anywhere, you should try to get involved as much as possible in dentistry. That would show that you still, you know, um, wanted to get involved and you're ambitious about your profession. So I hope that this would is very helpful, and um, I will hand over to Brian, and we are open for questions that you may have. Over to Brian. Thank you, Dr. Manish. So now we're going to take some of your questions. Um, let me just instruct everybody on how to ask questions. You'll see a question box there on the right. Uh, Dr. Amro, Dr. Manish, uh, there are questions in your queue. Uh, just go ahead and start with the first one. Okay, um, here's the, the first question. Uh, 
how hard it is to become a dentist in the United States. So I would say it's not that hard, but it's not that easy also. It depends on how motivated you are. And if you're highly motivated, it's not at all hard. It definitely would take a lot of your uh, uh, time and motivation. And if you are really want to become a US trained dentist, and you follow the the application process well on time, it, I think it's not at all a difficult process. Um, I see a question here mentioning uh, any way to practice dentistry in USA without appearing for MBDE. Um, that is not possible. Um, even there was, I recall, the state of Minnesota had this a special way for licensure. I don't think that's uh, valid anymore. You have to take uh, national boards part one and part two and then you can practice. Uh, but under all circumstances you have to uh, pass both parts uh, whether through AGD or international dental program. So um, that's um, one of the core requirements for licensure in the US. So the next question is, uh, do we need to pass NBDE2 to enroll in dental school for foreign dentists? Um, it's not necessarily, as of now, uh, the part two is uh, not necessarily all the schools. There are few schools, in fact, there are very few schools who accept uh, part one only. But for most of the other schools, they would accept part one and part two. And in the coming years, by beginning of 2020, Part one and part two is going to get integrated. So you would need both of the parts. But as of now, there are only a handful of schools who would accept just part one. But and I we definitely encourage you to give part two also before you apply to data schools. And the third question is mentioned is research or masters compulsory to get into AGD? Uh, that's actually a really good question. Uh, there is no compulsory requirements for that, uh, but it's definitely a plus. And the reason is uh, you are actually applying to a graduate program, so you are being treated or excuse me treated as a graduate, uh, unlike the international dental program where they will consider you going back as a student. So uh, I would strongly encourage that if you are applying to AGD, absolutely. Okay. So the next question is, uh, please, how many years till the NBD part one and part two expire, and, and what we do if our NBD part uh, NBD expires? I think, as far as I know, it's valid only for five years. Am I right, Amro? I think it's only valid for five years. The national uh, board. I think it, it's now valid for for life. Uh, once you pass the national boards, you don't have to retake it ever again. Okay, uh, that's new to me. I thought it was only valid for five years. Yeah, now that Amber has updated that it's uh, for life. Uh, okay, yeah, but I think more information can be found on the uh, the NBDE website because they are going to combine the exams. So if you have just given your part one score and you do not intend to give your part two part two uh, exam till 2020. You, it is better to contact the national boards for more information on that. Right. Um, yeah. Are you taking the next question, Amro? I am. I was just to keep yeah. scrolling down. Uh, so it says, do you think IDP is better than AGD or post-grad residency or vice versa? Uh, I think uh, the IDP program gives you a really good opportunity to um, have everything open, like all options that you can explore if you want to practice as a GP, if you want to apply to residencies, if you want to even do AGD afterwards. So I think it's, um, it's actually um, one of those opportunities that would allow you to pursue whatever else you want. So I personally prefer it, but for other people, may not be really willing to work on mannequins again, so this is something for you actually to decide. But um, I personally prefer the IDP program, yes.
Okay. How different is the school culture when compared to dental school in India? Uh, okay, the, the school is definitely much uh, different here because we are uh, the our curriculum is very uh, you know condensed. It's a four-year program generally, and it is condensed into a two-year program. So everything is very stressful. We have more exams. And um, we have uh, different kind of subjects, which is, as I said, like critical thinking, and uh, they also prepare us to uh, you know, be better dental practitioners and outside being better dental practice managers. So definitely, it's more different uh, a culture in the school. The, the the faculties are also more approachable, I would say. And you can, you know, have one-to-one -one talk with them. They are very open for uh, discussions. They also, you know, encourage us to ask questions in the classrooms. So I'm very happy with my program here, and uh, yeah, it's but it's, it's definitely better. I'm learning a lot, even even with my experience uh, of so many years. I'm still learning so much, a lot over here. So this is, a, I would say, a very positive step. I would like to uh, add to this. Um, absolutely. I actually agree with many of the things you mentioned. Um, the culture of, of the dental school here, um, I would say, is, uh, varies differently a lot because um, you get engaged in, in many different, um, I would say, not just um, dental-related activities, but school-related activities which you can find yourself in and one of them is is what me and, and Manish are doing right now which is being a part of ASDA for instance or, or being part of of the dental associations uh, in, in every state so it's gonna give you a lot of opportunity to flourish um, I personally think um, you're gonna enjoy it a lot it's absolutely worthwhile um, it's gonna drain you a little bit so be prepared it's gonna be <laughs> a, a tough journey but I know personally that uh, you are tough as well and you're gonna make the best out of it so just keep going yeah and, and yes it's uh, the journey is not easy also once you get accepted to the school it's not like a piece of cake you have to go through a lot of things <laughs> I'm not going to agree to that <laughs> But from the other side, like uh, since I graduated, I can tell you it's uh, absolutely worthwhile. So yeah, absolutely. That's hang right. in there. <laughs> I'm just waiting to graduate now. <laughs> okay, how many international applications do dental schools get each cycle? Okay, you taking that, Ambro? How many international? Um, so on in the year I applied, that was almost three years ago. Uh, my own school got around 670. Uh, I know that number uh, grew to, to 1,000. I believe right now it's 1,000 plus. So yes. it's getting more and more every day. Um, Manish, what about you? Yeah, it is, it is somewhere around 1,000. That's what I've, I, I got to know from one of my uh, faculty at school. They say approximately 1,000. And yeah, it is increasing day by day. And it's becoming going to become more tough especially when they are going to integrate part one and part two. It's good because the syllabus for the part one and part two is going to be different, you know, it's going to be much more vast. They're going to, it's become going to become more competitive now. So the next question is, uh, does it make a difference if you are doing a public health degree but haven't completed it yet? Does it add the same impact in your application? Okay. Um, I haven't done public health, but I have a few friends who have done, and what I have known from them is they would like you to finish your degree and then come, because during the interview, they do ask, what are you doing? So if you say that I'm, I'm still enrolled in the program, and they would ask you, um, when is your program finishing? So if that date extends beyond the date of the start of your uh, dental uh, school, there, that could be a reason for you not getting accepted because I feel that they, they want you to finish your program and then come into this school. So do, does Emro have a different view on that? Uh, I totally agree with what you mentioned, yes. Uh, they would like you to finish the degree before uh, you apply. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another very commonly asked question, a good GPA score, and I did answer in my presentation that 
Again, our GPS core uh, varies from the country of origin where you have studied. And um, anything, although anything above three is good, um, some schools would mention about, you know, that if you have a, a minimum score of, uh, say, around 3.3, or they, they generally mention a competitive score. That the, this is a competitive score. But again, as said, it, as the um, the countries do not have a standardized uh, uh, you know educational system, so their exam system is different. So it may be that people from your country may have um, somewhat a score which is a little less, but people from other country may may be having a much higher score. But you don't have to worry about those because the schools take into consideration when you are, they are reading your application. They see if you from which country you are and what is the uh, general uh, score of students who are applying from your country. I hope this answers your question. And also adding to Manish, uh, remember like GPA is only part of the application. Yeah. And I hear a lot that some schools wouldn't even take a look at, at applications if it's below a certain number, typically three. Um, speaking from my personal experience, I personally, when I applied to the IDP programs, I did not have what is called like a really good score in, in GPA. And um, I think what really helped is having something after school that shows that you could actually achieve a higher uh, GPA, whether it's a post program, um, residency, or diploma. Because we all understand that you cannot go back in time and change that GPA, but definitely look forward to what you can do to show that you're competent enough to be accepted and will be considered as a person who works hard for his GPA. So keep your hopes high and, and work hard for it. Yeah. And many applicants actually uh, do a master's program based in public health to improve upon their GPA, and if they get a better GPA in master public health, they definitely improve the profile. So whether doing it, doing an MPH degree to get into a dental program is a good idea or not, it also depends how good or, you know, how, how is your profile overall. So if, you, if you're lacking in certain areas in your profile, I think doing a master's program will definitely add to your profile. And Manisha, I'll go ahead and answer these next two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. The first question, do you know anything about AJD? Uh, <laughs> I know a little bit about it in the presentation I mentioned. Um, so, uh, can you practice after AGD? Yes. Uh, not in all states, it's a number of states, and that also keeps changing. Uh, I would say uh, keep on updating yourself. Where are you interested in practicing? Visit their state boards, you can contact them personally and ask because this is not something that's constant. I believe the main uh, court to licensure is through the DDS. Um, AGD process uh, change uh, regularly. So uh, I would advise you to check the, their websites. Okay, so I'm taking this question. Um, Capit asks for three letters of recommendation. As I'm doing masters in public health in the United States, should I get the recommendation letters from dental faculty back in my country or should I get a reference uh, from my public health faculty, considering CAPID only allows up for three, and one has to be from the dean of the dental school. So, if I was in your position, I would take uh, one from the dean of the dental school, one from the the faculty of my master's program, and one that the third one can be either from your dental faculty from India or, or from your own country or uh, from anyone in the United States. You definitely need um, a recommendation letter from the faculty of your master's uh, program because that will uh, show what you're doing currently and how you're improving upon your profile. They would definitely reflect in that letter. So the next question is asking how important is a master's before applying to dental school here in the US? Um, I would say uh, different schools have different perspectives on, on all the different topics we mentioned, on your TOEFL score, on your GPA, on whether you did masters or not. Uh, so it, it really varies from one program to another, but I would say having a masters in, is an absolute plus, and the reason is 
again, if you, for example, in your BDS did not have a good GPA for any reason, uh, this is an opportunity for you to show them that I can do better, for instance, and it always shows that you have much more experience. The next question is, uh, does an international dentist need reference letter from his or, home, his or her home country or someone from the U.S.? Well, if you can get someone from the U.S., that is definitely a plus. So, but if you do not have anyone, you, you have no choice. You have to get it from your home country. But aim to get a recommendation letter from the United States. But also, uh, if you have really worked uh, you know, substantially with someone in your own home country, it would be a good idea to get it from that person, and if that person has, uh, you know, a diverse experience, as I said, is, is well known in dentistry, that would be a best bet. So the question afterwards, and uh, that's a really good question, is asking, will giving the ADAT exam uh, also improve my chances to get into IDP program? So for those of you who uh, have a little bit of familiarity of uh, how you applied to dental schools here in the U.S., typically as a graduate of college, um, just like a, a regular uh, student here in the U.S., you have to do what is called the DAT exam. Uh, they are having an advanced one, and that advanced DAT exam is for post-grad programs. So that's another way to evaluate you. Uh, will this be considered by IDP? Um, for the time being, I don't think so, because uh, there are other evaluatory uh, criteria. Uh, again, check their websites. Uh, every cycle, things differ from one time to another. I recall one year, um, NYU, uh, New York University, actually asked for the DAT for international dentists. So uh, keep yourself updated and go to the CAPID website, check the, the different uh, programs, and, and see if they uh, ask for it. Uh, but uh, why I wanted to mention this specifically is if it's not mentioned on the website, then most probably um, they will not. Uh, it will not make a difference. Um, for example, I, I personally used to ask this question: if if some of the schools that ask for national board exams for part one, if I took like for example part two, would that make me a better applicant? And they said, as long as we didn't ask for it, we will not even consider it. So whether you have it or not, it's going to be beneficial for you and the school, but does not mean that you will be a, a, like a stronger applicant. So something to keep in mind as well. Okay, the next question is, uh, does working as a dental assistant help? I've heard that admissions committees don't really like that. Well, um, I would uh, disagree with uh, what you have heard. Uh, working as a dental assistant uh, definitely would help improving your profile because it is showing that you are still involved with dentistry. On a regular basis, you are, uh, you know, interacting with uh, uh, patients in the dental office. You, uh, if you had a choice, you would have, you know, done dentistry yourself. But because you're not licensed, you are doing something uh, which helps you to get involved in the industry, and that's that's what you're doing. So I definitely do not see that admission community uh, dislike that. It just you can add in your personal statement that to get involved with the industry and because of the, uh, the, uh, the restrictions of not having a license with you, you were trying to improve your profile. And that is a plus point for your uh, personal statement. Um, just have to go up again. Yeah. Uh, Amro, the next question is, uh, how do you get into research work in the United States? Uh, that's a really good question, um, how to get into research. Um, basically, you, you can contact uh, a number of different uh, educational institutes. Uh, that is where most research is conducted. You can uh, try finding um, through different websites, for example, if it's related to a certain university or an academic facility. If they do uh, have research programs conducted by Dr. So-and-so, you can go ahead and contact that person directly and tell them, I'm an international dentist, I would like to work with you, and I would like to have some research experience. Uh, there are actually some uh, programs for research that you can go through, and typically it's some sort of fellowships. 
Um, it's uh, it's it really it's program based, so it depends from one program to another, and it's typically done in one like area of dentistry or one field like endodontics or or uh, or uh, orthodontics or whatever else. So this is one way to do it basically. So the next question is, is it true there will be changes to NVDE in future? If so, is it going to be more tough? As I just mentioned, uh, NVDE is going to, uh, part one and part two is going to get integrated in uh, the beginning of 2020. And yes, now that there will be one exam which will involve um, so many subjects together, I believe it's going to be more tough uh, than the, the present situation. And Manish, I think the next question is directed to you. Examples or resources on how to improve examples or resources on how to improve critical thinking. Well, I would uh, suggest uh, reading articles um, uh, like uh, various studies, and you know, start analyzing those studies uh, whether they have been done correctly, whether. Um, they have been uh, they, whether there was a good hypothesis in that uh, particular article. They were they, they conducted the way they should be. Whether there is a good comparison between the control groups and you know that's the way of doing the study. So when you keep reading many articles, you will get into that point of thinking or uh, analyzing critically. Especially, you can also start reading a letter to editors. You know, those are the spe specific areas where the authors address critical mistakes in other manuscripts. So when you start reading, you will understand that what you should be looking for, and it will help you develop that uh, you know attitude towards finding any mistakes, if any uh, there is any uh, in the manuscript. And that's what is critical thinking all about. I hope this answers your question. So the question afterwards, how long you should shadow a dentist? Um, there isn't really a time limit. Uh, I would say shadow a dentist until he gets to know you really well because at that point in time, uh, he will be able to write a personalized letter of recommendation just like Manish said and that makes a huge difference in your application. So I would strongly recommend that you uh, be there with that dentist until you both know each other very well. Yeah. I want to add uh, over here that many times we approach other, uh, for example, for getting involved into research or getting a recommendation letter by starting uh, emails or you know communication that hey I'm going to apply to the international dentist program and I am in need of this. So that should not be your approach. You should show genuine interest in what you are going to do. Should not be okay. I'm here in the United States for ten days. Let's let's shadow. The dentist is not going to give you any recommendation letter for that. I mean, you, because it was not enough time for you to build a rapport. So as as Emma also said, you should have enough time to build a rapport so that he can give you a personalized letter. Okay. So next question is: uh, If we have some year gap or without experience, how do we address that in our application? Well, um, this is again a uh, very commonly seen and very commonly asked question. Um, well, you can always give a reason for that, and uh, that reason should be presented in a well, you know, um, should be well addressed. And you should also try to support uh, it by, uh, you know, showing that even if you're not involved in dentistry at that particular time, you were involved in something that helped you hone your hand skills, you know. For example, if you if you uh, someone who likes to, as I said, like to play guitar, you know, uh, guitar is something which involves a lot of hand skill and hand to eye coordination. That what is dentistry all about? So if you can say that those that time period because of some you know personal reasons you could were not involved with dentistry, but you were still you know working on your hand skills, then definitely uh, be a good reason for you know being away from dentistry. And let me add to that, Manish. Uh, it's um, as as uh, Manish was actually saying that um, most dental programs want to see you always pursuing dentistry. Even let's say you applied here, didn't get accepted, or or for any reason, um, 
like you were applying a second time. They always want to see what difference did you do from that last cycle and they want to see that you were engaged in dentistry in one way or another. Uh, remember that you, by applying, you have a number of ways to express yourself. So number one, and that's very important, is the personal statement. Okay, and that's where you can go ahead and mention everything that could be related to this, um, or not necessarily. You can just give a little bit of a hint of it, and then eventually, when you get an interview, you can go a little bit in depth. And um, I think they will ask you about that, and I'll just know your your thoughts about it. So be prepared with your answer. And they always like to see somebody who is engaged in dentistry as much as possible. So, um, something to keep in mind. Uh, the question afterwards is saying, I would like to know whether working as a dental assistant is better or volunteering as a dental assistant is better. Uh, both are exactly the same. There is absolutely no difference when you're applying. Uh, what they want to know is that you actually had a, a hands-on experience in the U.S. You have an idea how the system works. That's the basic thing. Uh, nobody's expecting you to come as experienced person that you know how everything works because you will be a student, you will be a resident, you will be somebody who will be learning. Okay, so uh, they just want to know that you have an input on the system, so it's not going to be like a shock for you just to move directly to an educational institute here in the U.S. Okay. Uh, we missed out on one question. It was directed to me, Amro. It's, it says, is it possible to do a volunteering or shadowing on a tourist visa? Well, uh, uh, tourist visa definitely has restrictions and um, if you're not doing anything which is paid, I think that should not be an issue. If, in fact, I think if you're coming as a tourist and doing voluntary work or shadowing, it's a plus point. But make sure you do not, uh, you know, uh, Override the restrictions by the U.S. governments uh, about the visa, and as I said, it should not be paid. And uh, would Andrew like to add to that? Um, I don't really see any difference between both of them, but just like uh, you mentioned, Manish, yes, uh, they have some limitations uh, work-wise. Uh, so make sure you are uh, abiding by the laws regarding them. Yeah, as far as it's not paid, you're fine. Okay, so next question is uh, having a residency from home country is a good add on the profile uh, and my answer is definitely yes. If you have uh, a master's degree in your uh, profile, it definitely adds to your profile, 101%. Um, Manish, I can actually follow on the questions. Do you see the next one? Mm -hmm. uh, which one? Um, the next question um, <clears throat> is, I'll take that. Uh, how can I be a part of any research if I'm not a student at the university and without any research training? Well, um, it again depends on your networking with the, uh, the research, uh, with the professor or the research fellow and uh, your ability to convince to them that you are a good candidate uh, and you can be a part of that uh, research. You know, it just you have to show uh, you have to communicate well with them and show that you are you know willing to get involved and it is of your genuine interest you're going to get involved and not just to improve your on your profile and get accepted into the your international interest program. So it's it's how you present to them. And the next question is 12 months of shadowing in total is enough. I think that is absolutely more than enough. Um, again, try to understand that when the school is looking at your profile, they're looking at everything. They, they have like a global view. So you don't want to spend like too much effort in only one side and neglect everywhere else. Make sure that you are working. If you can get like some research experience, you can, uh, in addition to the shadowing, you can uh, do like a master's program. That would also add a lot. So um, try to be engaged in all the different uh, areas as well. Okay, the next question is, is there any advantage of having a green card? Um, there are particular programs which uh, you know, take only students who are uh, green card or citizens of the United States, such as uh, I think Tufts uh, take people who are having a green card. And apart from that, I do not see that 
it is an added advantage to any other school which uh, clearly mentions in their uh, application eligibility criteria that you should have a green card. Okay. And the question after that, it asks, do you have any tips for the interviews and bench exams? Well, that's a huge topic to talk about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's a lot of tips uh, to mention. We have a webinar on that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so regarding interviews, I would recommend you to um, try to get in touch with people who went through this process before know their uh, ideas and, and perspectives on it. Also talk to people in that school if you can. I mean, I, I, I think many schools would welcome you to go around and do like a little tour. And then you're going to meet people who are just like you who applied last year and got accepted and now they're I'm sure they're going to go ahead and share all their experiences with you. Uh, the bench exams, this is very critical because um, there are a lot of standardized um, you could say way of examination for bench tests here. So you got to know what you will be asked for, uh, what kind of material you need to have. Uh, there are a couple of different types of typodons that are used for East Coast schools and West Coast schools could be a little bit different as well. So uh, I would recommend you contacting uh, like I, the international program, uh, international students in these programs or asking the, the school uh, themselves so you have uh, uh, an idea about it. Also there are some bench exam uh, preparatory programs that you can attend so that is helpful sometimes as well. Okay. So the next question is how to explain years of unemployment in my application after graduation. Well um, you will have to certainly uh, work upon your application and give a good reason for not being uh, involved in dentistry and uh, apart from that, you should be working on how to improve your other aspects of your application. As I said, if one of one aspect of your application is lacking, it does not mean that you will not get accepted. You should stop worrying about what you cannot improve, but start working on what you can improve. Try to get a very good TOEFL score. You know, clear both part one and part two when you are applying. If you just if you have a low GPA score and you've been unemployed for a long period of time, I would say try to get into a master's program and show them that you can get a good GPA score. Because the schools, the school people are looking for someone who can handle stress of dental schools here. The, the education is quite stressful here, and it is as it condensed into two-year program. So they don't. They want someone who's you know capable of handling everything. So you need to work on the the other aspects of your application, and not to think about what is lacking. So the question afterwards says, what are the chances of a fresh graduate to be accepted? Uh, how can he improve, uh, or how can they improve their chances to be accepted? So the chances I would say are um, are pretty high as well. Um, I, in my uh, experience, like I, in my school year and my class, I had people who were fresh graduates and I had people who had 20 years of experience. So you can see somebody else in the middle. Um, how can you improve? Uh, the things that Manish uh, mentioned are extremely important. Having some uh, hands-on experience here in the U.S., uh, definitely some shadowing, uh, any sorts of research you did in your home country. A good GPA score, a high TOEFL score, all these contribute to you. So uh, do not feel ever discouraged that you are a fresh graduate and you cannot get in. I saw all sort of uh, different levels of, of uh, dentists getting uh, accepted into different programs. So just uh, make sure you are high on, on, on all these different topics. Okay, we have time for one more question and then we have some follow-up slides. Okay, uh, this is the question. It says also working in a dental office is considered as good or masters in, is considered better. So working in a dental office and doing masters are two different things. I mean, it's one is a university setting where you are you know, going through a curriculum provided by the university. You're going to get a GPA score, but working in a dental office is a different totally different situation. If you ask me, I would say your masters would improve your profile better than working in a dental office. 
Okay, thank you, Amro, and thank you, Manish, on an excellent presentation. Uh, great questions and great answers. Um, I just have a couple of follow-up slides for the attendees. Let's see. To help us evaluate this program and the need for future programs, we'll be sending out a brief survey. We would appreciate if you could take a few minutes to fill this out. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and all registrants will receive a link to access the recording by the end of the week. For additional resources, visit ASDA's website at www.asdanet.org where you can find webinars for international dentists, tips on getting licensed in the U U.S., a guide to applying to U.S. dental schools for international trained dentists, and more. We encourage you to join the American Student Dental Association as a pre-dental or international member. Pre-dental membership is open to any undergraduate, high school student, or individual pursuing dentistry as a career that resides in the United States. Foreign trained dentists living in the U.S. who will be applying to dental school to become licensed in the United States should also choose this category. International dental student membership is open to qualifying students currently enrolled in and attending an international dental school outside of the United States and its possessions. As a special incentive, join this week and your membership will be extended through 2017. So that's three additional months of membership. You can join online at the URL on the screen. <clears throat> and as Amro said, please like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash ASDA International Dentists. Here you can find tips for international students shared resources from fellow dentists and featured members. And then here's a page with all the links. Um, if you have additional questions, you can email Amro, Manish, or myself. Here's the link to join. And then here's our social media, um, our Facebook and Instagram accounts, should you like to uh, participate in those. I'd like to thank everyone for a great webinar, and thank you for attending and taking the time of your evening, especially you, Manish, and you, Amro. Uh, great job, and I hope everybody has a great night tonight. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.